Okay, uh, so um, it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce a speaker for these. This is a uh, Raoul Bott Memorial uh, Lectures in Mathematics and Physics, and our speaker today is is uh, Mina Agenagic. She's uh, currently a professor of math, uh, physics and mathematics at Berkeley. Um, and some of her background, she uh, got her PhD from Caltech uh, about 10 years ago, I know, 20 years, 1999. And uh, then was a assistant professor. <laughs> I'm flying. Sure. I'm just <laughs> Where did the time go? Uh, an assistant professor at the University of Washington, and uh, well, she was postdoc here at Harvard for a number of years, and then an assistant professor at the University of Washington, and and then a professor at uh, in physics and mathematics at Berkeley. And she also a uh, Simon's Fellowship and uh, a fellow of the American Physical Society. So. Uh, Okay. Um, well, thank you for, for inviting me to give these lectures. It's, it's an honor, of course. Um, it's also an honor because um, uh, Harvard is, uh, uh, was, was a very special place in my career. I pretty much learned at Harvard all the, most of the math and physics I know. So, um, Okay. Now, I noticed that in advertising these lectures, um, they were advertised as lectures on string theory. Now, <laughs> this was not the intent. Uh, they're more like lessons from string theory. Okay. Uh, for math. All right. So um, this um, first lecture will be based on joint works with uh, Andrei Okunkov and uh, with Nikita Nekrasov. So um, uh, now there exists a, a remarkable string theory in six dimensions that is um, labeled by simply least Lie algebra, G. Um, now, the string theory uh, is called little string theory because it arises as a small piece of the full 10-dimensional uh, type 2 string compactified on an 80 surface of type G. So what makes the theory remarkable, in part, is that um, it turns out to be a source of insights uh, for questions that come from pure mathematics. So. Uh, in other places, I um, discussed applications of little string theory to the geometric Langlands program. And in today's lecture, I will describe an application to integrable lattice models and to representation theory. In the lecture tomorrow, we will describe, um, I will describe applications of little string theory to the not categorification program. So let me, let's start by, um, uh, describing the class of integrable lattice models we'll study today. So we'll pick an AD Lie algebra, G. So fix one of these. Um, and uh, we'll also pick a Riemann surface, which we'll call C. And Riemann surface can be one of a complex plane, um, a complex um, infinite cylinder, or uh, an elliptic curve. So uh, this curve C um, is the spectral curve. Now, the most general case corresponds to taking C to be a torus, a complex torus, and as all others can be obtained uh, from it by degeneration. So that's what we'll do. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, the models that um, are based on solutions of uh, young baxter or star triangle equation uh, that is associated to the choice of Lie algebra and C. So here's what the equation says. Let me pick it up. So um, firstly, for every line in a, in a diagram such as this, every such line, we have three here, uh, is labeled by a choice of representation of G and a spectral parameter, a point on the spectral curve. So to align, you associate a point on the spectral curve and a representation. Now, each segment uh, of a line labeled by, um, um, by a given representation is assigned one of its weights. Okay? So to this line, I get to assign three weights, because there are three segments. Um, each face is colored by a complex vector whose rank is that of the Lie algebra. 
Now, um, the rule is that the uh, value of z on adjacent faces is um, jumps. Uh, jumps according to the weight on the segment you cross. Okay? So it jumps in the following way, with some parameter h bar. Now, this, this means that we get to pick z on any one face of a diagram, so any one face, and all the others are fixed. So these um, rank of the Lie algebra complex numbers are the dynamical parameters. Now, the parameter h bar um, that determines the jumping um, is the quantization parameter. <clears throat> um, the notation is odd. Things are classical when h bar is 1. But um, such, as, such as it is. Anyway, to each vertex in, an, in, um, in a diagram, one associates an R matrix that depends on all the underlying data, including the spectral and the dynamical parameters. To evaluate a diagram uh, such as this, um, sorry, to evaluate a diagram uh, such as this, one takes a product over R matrices associated with the vertices and sums over all data that's not fixed by the asymptotics. Okay, so here I get, in this diagram, I get one weight to sum over. Um, now, the model is integrable, provided uh, the R matrices solve uh, the Young-Baxter equation, which says that you may slide the lines at will without affecting the answer. Now, given any solution to the quantum Young-Baxter equation, depending on spectral parameters, um, we get integrable lattice models, which use the corresponding R matrix, R matrix as vertices. <clears throat> so here are two examples. Now, the Young-Baxter equation is a, is a vastly overdetermined system, so it's surprising that it has any non-trivial solutions at all. The solutions corresponding to a spectral curve, which is a torus, and depending on spectral and dynamical parameters, are the most interesting and, and hard to find. Um, and from these, one can recover all others by taking limits. Now, a general construction of such R matrices uh, is one of the results of the joint work with Andre, um, which I'll tell you about. Now, there is, at least in principle, an alternative path to construct such R matrices using recent work of Costello, Webb, Witten, and Yamazaki based on a certain four-dimensional gauge theory. Connection between these two approaches um, is uh, explained in this joint work with Nikita Nekrasov. Now, uh, the little string theory associated with Lie algebra G um, turns out to play a crucial role in uh, essentially all aspects of this story, as you'll see. So um, part of the interest in these elliptic R matrices is a conjecture by Igor Frankel and Nikolai Rashitikin from 92. So they conjectured that elliptic R matrices, depending on a spectral and dynamical parameters and solving a quantum Young-Baxter equation are monodromy matrices of the quantum Knizhnik zamological equation. The quantum Knizhnik zamological equation is the deformation of the ordinary Knizhnik zamological equation associated with the affine Lie algebra um, G. G hat. The ordinary um, Knizhnik zamological equation is a linear differential equation for a function that takes value in a tensor product of representations, um, or more precisely, um, in a subspace of it of fixed weight. Its solutions may be obtained as conformal blocks on a Riemann surface, which is a plane with punctures, or equivalently an infinite cylinder. Um, now, the equation is a first order linear differential equation with regular singularities where punctures on the Riemann surface collide. So either a pair of punctures collides, or they hit zero or infinity. It's a classic problem to describe analytic continuation of a fundamental solution of such an equation along, any, uh, along a path in parameter space that avoids the singular points. The analytic continuation gives um, a new solution uh, with some monodromy matrix M, which depends only on the homotopy type of the path. For the Knizhnik zamological equation, 
Um, the path in parameter space describes how positions of punctures on the Riemann surface vary as a function of time. Um, since it depends on a homotopy type of the path only, it give, the monotomy matrix gives an invariant uh, of a braid in uh, A, the Riemann surface, times time in three-dimensional space. So the, for Knizhik's homological equation, this monotomy problem was solved by, um, by Dreenfeld and, and Kono, and um, later refined by Kazan and Lustig. And they showed that monotomy matrices of the Knizhik's homological equation are generated by R matrices of the UQ quantum group associated with G. Um, the monotomy matrices of a general problem like this get represented as products of our R matrices associated to crossings at different times. Here we have three. Um, and again, one sums over all the data that's not fixed by the asymptotics. So the R matrices of the quantum group solve uh, an equation that's very similar to the quantum Young-Baxter equation, except one has to keep track of an over and under crossing, and they don't have any dependence on spectral parameters. So the monotomy matrices of the affine Lie algebra, they lead to braid and knot invariants, but they don't give you integrable lattice models. To get quantum integrable lattice models, um, integrable lattice models well, uh, arise by replacing the affine Lie algebra by the quantum affine algebra, which is its h bar deformation. So in doing so, whoops, in doing so, uh, one replaces the Knizhnik zemological equation, which is a first order linear differential equation, by the quantum Knizhnik zemological equation, which is a first order linear difference equation, where the step of the difference equation is related to kappa, the level of the Lie algebra, and h bar as follows. So you should really think of the deformation parameter as being h bar. And in the h bar to one limit with kappa fixed, the dif difference equation becomes the differential equation, okay. um, the quantum, the Knizhnik zemological equation. So monotomy matrices of quantum Knizhnik zemological equation were conjectured by Igor Frankel and Richard Tikin uh, to give integrable lattice models. <laughs> now, monotomies of a linear difference equation have a different flavor than um, that of a linear differential equation. So for a linear differential equation, monotomy matrices are constant, but they depend on the homotopy type of the path. For a linear difference equation, monogamy no longer depends on the path. Uh, there's no path to speak of, but its entries are not constant. So in the difference equation case, the monogamy matrices are elliptic functions of the variable um, P, the step of the difference equation. And um, they're, they're functions of the variables, and they're constant only under the shifts by step P. They are, um, they're not really constant, they're quasi-constant. They're constant under the shift of variables by P. Um, so a single um, mono uh, monogamy matrix with elliptic dependence on parameters captures all the path dependence of its h bar to one limit. So it's a very rich object, and uh, richer than its, uh, than its um, differential cousin. Um, <clears throat> now, one can think of solutions of the quantum, of the QKZ equation, the quantum Knizhnik zemological equations, as deformations of conformal blocks, as Q-conformal blocks of the affine Lie algebra on an infinite cylinder with punctures. So, analogous, so that's analogous to the conformal case. Um, um, they are, uh, one can describe them as chiral correlation functions of vertex operators, like this, except that everything is Q-deformed. So a chiral vertex operator, um, you can think of it as an intertwiner um, between a pair of Verma module representations, is labeled like in conformal case by its position and a choice of representation, and further, like in conformal case, by a choice of weight in that representation. This weight tells you the jump in the Verma module um, from left to right. So to encode that, um, one can represent a chiral vertex operator uh, by diagram such as this, where um, Z is in, 
<coughs> encoded the Verma modules on the left and the right, and their jump. So you get different, uh, conform different Q conformal blocks. Um, depending on choices, you get to make ensuing Carl vertex operators. And you can encode these in a diagram such as this. Okay? <coughs> the asymptotics here would fix the, fix the, uh, the net weight, but I have, might have different ways of, of, uh, of going from left to right by different z's. So at any fixed time, away from the vertices, this diagram encodes the data of a Q conformal block, where uh, z's um, keep track of the Vermont modular representations. So hence, monotony matrices themselves get encoded in diagrams such as this. They live in a plane because Path dependence, path independence of monotomy means that there's no difference in over and under crossing. Now, in replacing the affine Lie algebra by the quantum affine one, um, we end up breaking conformal symmetry um, because uh, the affine Lie algebra has Virasora as a subalgebra, while its deformation does not. So, correspondingly, working on an infinite cylinder and a plane are equivalent in conformal case, but here they're not. By working on an infinite cylinder, you get quantum affine algebra as a um, deformation of, of, of g hat. If you take the plane instead, you get a different deformation. You get a deformation corresponding to the Youngian. And uh, that deformation will give integrable lattice models corresponding to a spectral curve, which is um, uh, which is C star. So, but anyway, just like monodromies of conformal blocks give quantum um, and not quantum, quantum braid and not invariance, monodromies of Q conformal blocks give integrable uh, lattice model. Now, Frankel and Rishitikin didn't solve the monodromy problem that they posed in 92, but it did show that it's. Um, that its solution may be given in terms of R matrices that are associated with the vertices with elliptic dependence on parameters. As I said, the fact that dependence on parameters is elliptic comes from the fact that they're monodromies of a difference equation. <clears throat> the fact that monodromy uh, the, uh, depends only on the initial and the final point and not on the path between them uh, implies that the corresponding R matrix solves uh, the quantum Young-Baxter equation. Um, the equation the R matrix is solved is uh, called the quantum dynamical Young-Baxter equation because it involves non-trivial dependence on the dynamical parameters. If you were to replace um, C being a complex torus by an infinite uh, cylinder or a plane, this dependence on um, Dynamical depends a little bit how you take the limit, but this dependence on the dynamical parameters gets lost. At least you always lose dependence on half the parameters. Okay. In this case, um, in the elliptic case, the R matrices depend on both the dynamical and the spectral parameters, so they're as complicated as it gets. Now, there is a uniform construction of the corresponding elliptic R matrices uh, that um, comes from geometry. Um, it's immediate or origin, more precisely, it's geometry, but um, its conceptual origin ultimately is string theory. So, monodromy matrices um, act irreducibly on a subspace of conformal blocks of fixed um, weight. Um, that weight is the weight on all the edges at any given time. So that's a time-independent statement. So. Um, to such a subspace of conformal blocks at um, Q conformal blocks of fixed weight, one can associate the Nakajima quiver variety, which we'll call X. Um, the quiver variety is based on a quiver, has a quiver diagram that's based on a Dinkin diagram of G. Um, now, in the quiver, for each node of the Dinkin diagram, one gets um, a pair of finite dimensional vector spaces. Their ranks, um, determine the space of conformal blocks, Q-conformal blocks we want to study. So, for example, um, uh, the ranks of the framing vector spaces are determined by the, by the um, representations on the edges. And 
And uh, the ranks of the Vs are determined by the total weight in that representation in a simple way. The Nakajima quiver variety is a hyperkähler quotient of the representation space of the quiver uh, by the gauge of the cotangent space to that by the gauge group. Now, it, as you'll see, um, it turns out that the quantum kinetic zimological equation and its solutions, uh, the Q-conformal blocks, are computed by quantum K theory of X. The quantum K theory, um, it computes Euler characters of certain vector bundles on moduli spaces of holomorphic quasi-maps from D to X, where D is a Riemann surface. The study of quantum K-theory as a generalization of gramov witten theory began by Giventhal in the 90s. And um, what we'll need here is a version of that theory um, as formulated by Malik and, and Okunkov a few years ago. So their definition uses crucially the fact that um, the quiver variety is a holomorphic symplectic variety. So the basic object of this theory um, is uh, called the K-theoretic vertex function. So what it is, is a generating function of equivariant counts of quasi-maps from D to X, where we choose D as follows. Um, you can think of it as a, as a P1 um, with a puncture at infinity and zero, but actually it's better to think of it as, an, um, as sort of an infinitely long cigar, as we'll eventually see. So one works equivariantly with respect to um, torus of automorphisms of X, um, where um, there's, there, there's a part that, um, that preserves the, the holomorphic symplectic form, which we'll call A, and a part that scales it by H bar, and with respect to rotations of the domain curve. Now, a key result of quantum K theory, that's due to Okunkov, is that um, these vertex functions that I, that I described, they come from geometry, of Nakajima quiver varieties, or its quantum version, um, in the, uh, actually solve the quantum kinetic zimological equation. So before I tell you how to solve it, um, it turns out that all the ingredients in uh, solutions of the equation, which you can think of as these Q-conformal blocks, have a geometric interpretation in terms of x. Um, the positions of vertex operators are the equivariant modula of x. Um, associated with uh, torus symmetries that preserves the holomorphic symplectic form. Um, the choice of Verma module, remember, that gets related to the dynamical parameters, and I get rank G of the Lie algebra worth of those, um, is encoded in the variables that keep track of the degrees of quasi-maps to X, and basically a Kähler of variables. The parameter H bar is that uh, in the quantum affine algebra is the parameter corresponding to uh, scaling of the holomorphic symplectic form. And the step P of the QKZ equation is parameter of rotation of the domain curve. Um, so um, we get different solutions to the QKZ equation by, um, <coughs> by uh, picking um, different components of, uh, di by choosing different vertex functions, the difference is the data that you place at infinity of D. Okay. So they'll give you, um, this is also where uh, eventually braiding will take place. <clears throat> so now quantum K theory for free, essentially, it's not for free, it's a hard theorem. It gives you right away uh, solutions to quantum kinetic zimological equation. However, the solutions that you get are not um, Q-conformal blocks. Um, the, the reason they're not is that um, conformal blocks and the Q-deformations will give you a fundamental solution of the equation that's analytic in a certain chamber corresponding to a choice of ordering of chiral vertex operators. Right. The, um, uh, that determines how a Q-conformal block is sewn together from pieces. The vertex functions, instead, give a fundamental solution of the QKZ equation that have no particular analyticity whatsoever in terms of the A parameters, which are simply equivariant variables. Instead, they are analytic in a chamber of, of Kähler moduli of X. 
So that's a chamber of dynamical parameters associated with weights of the Verma module. So it doesn't seem like this is actually what we want if we are going to solve the braiding problem. Now, and so to solve a braiding problem, we need to, to, to have something that actually cares about ordering of, uh, of vertex operators, right? So now, on general grounds, um, given any two solutions of uh, fundamental solutions of the equation, there's a linear map between them. Uh, so there's such a linear map, depending on a choice of ordering of vertex operators, chamber will exist. <clears throat> now, it turns out that one can actually find it explicitly. And one can find it explicitly because it turns out to have a geometric meaning. The linear map is computed by um, elliptic stable envelopes of the Nakajima quiver variety X, as it turns out. So the stable envelopes provide a very special basis of um, equivariant elliptic cohomology of X. Um, it's a, what it is is a map uh, from equivariant elliptic cohomology of the fixed point set in X to elliptic, equivariant elliptic cohomology of the whole X, which associates to a class of a, T of a fixed point, a class that's supported on, a, on the stable attracting cycle to that fixed point. Okay. <clears throat> so it's, a, it's sort of a Morse theory-like object, um, it, but in, in an algebraic sense. So um, the stable basis reduces monotony problem of once you have it. Um, it reduces the monotony problem of the QKZ equation to matrix multiplication. So monotony of the, of the QKZ equation from one chamber to another is a composition of maps from A solutions in one chamber to Z solutions, if you want, and back to the A solutions of another chamber. So it just becomes a linear algebra problem. Um, the existence and uniqueness of um, these elliptic stable envelopes under and approved for any um, Nakajima quiver variety. And ex explain how to construct them um, recursively. So uh, the, this, these elliptic stable bases are substantial generalizations of stable bases in cohomology and K-theory due to Malik and Akunkov. Um, the K-theoretic and cohomological degenerations depend on fewer variables and lead to integrable lattice models based on, um, on, an, on an infinite cylinder or a complex plane instead. All right. Now, the explanation why um, such geometric constructions of integrable lattice models exist, what do Nakajima quiver varieties have to do with, um, with integrable lattice models? Um, and more generally, why is it possible to break conformal symmetry while preserving um, and in some ways getting a better structure uh, comes from string theory. The string theory we need is this little string theory, which uh, is a small piece of 10-dimensional type 2 string um, on an AD, compactified on an ADE surface of type G. There, is, there exists, in fact, a pair of such theories uh, for any G, depending on whether one starts in 10 dimensions with type 2A or type 2B string theory. For this talk, I'll call the resulting little string theory type A and type, P, type B by their 10 dimensional origin. So the B type little string theory um, associated to um, Lie algebra G is a six dimensional string that's obtained by taking type 2B string theory on an AD surface of type G, which we'll call Y, where you keep only the degrees of freedom at the singularity. So the AD surface is a resolution of a C squared mod gamma singularity, where gamma is a discrete subgroup of SU2 related to uh, G by McKay correspondence. And resolution of singularity produces a collection of vanishing two cycles, spheres, intersecting according to the Dinkin diagram of G. So B-type um, little string theory inherits D brains from the 10-dimensional string, and it has D brains which are uh, 0, 2, 4, and 6-dimensional. They originate from D brains in 10-dimensional string wrapping the uh, two cycles in Y, two cycles at the singularity. 
the A type string originates instead from type 2A string theory on, on, on Y and has D brains of dimensions 1, 3, and 5 instead. So the dimensions are odd in type 2A, uh, in, in type A, and even in type B. Now, as a string theory, little string theory has a T duality symmetry that takes a circle of radius R to a circle of radius 1 over R while taking a D brain which um, is supported uh, on the, which wraps the circle to a D-brain that's a point on a dual circle. So, and in fact, compacted, so as string theory is compactified on a circle, type A and type B string theories are equivalent. They're related by T-duality that exchanges the string and momentum winding modes on a circle. So in that sense, they're full-fledged string theories. Um, uh, in the point particle limit of full 10 dimensional string theory, you get um, gravity and, um, um, and, and so forth. Uh, in, the, in case of uh, little string theory, um, you, get, um, you get theories with local G symmetry, that are quantum field theories, but without gravity. So in type A, uh, you get a six dimensional gauge. As, as a, in the point particle limit of type A little string theory, you get a six dimensional gauge theory. Uh, with gauge group based on Lie algebra G. And type B will give you a mysterious quantum field theory without Lagrangian description. Uh, that's a theory of two forms. Um, now, the Q conformal blocks that we've been studying are partition functions, as it turns out, of little string theories with D brains. Um, so one starts with B type string theory associated with Lie algebra G on a six manifold of the following form. It's a product of A, the Riemann surface where the Q conformal blocks live, times D, that's the domain curve of quantum, quantum K theory, times C, um, another um, complex plane. So the geometry in question is already here. Um, um, the vertex operators come from a collection of two-dimensional D-brains on M6 that are supported on D, they're at points on A, and they're at the origin of this extra complex plane. The, the, again, all the data of the of conformal, Q-conformal blocks has a string theory meaning. And the choice of Verma module state is a choice of moduli of little string theory. Um, the, the parameters h bar uh, and p correspond to choice of a background uh, that string theory is placed on. Uh, p and h bar come from equivariant rotations of the two complex planes, p of d and h bar of this plane c. Now, um, partition functions of little string theory in this background um, turn out to be computable uh, by a version of supersymmetric localization. Due to the background that we put a theory on, um, the six-dimensional theory actually turns out to be trivial. So there's, in fact, no interesting degrees of freedom at all in the bulk, um, away from uh, where the D-brains are. So with the D-brains added, the partition function of the full six-dimensional string theory turns out to equal to the partition function of the theories on the D-brains. The theory on the D-brains um, turns out to be um, a three-dimensional quiver gauge theory with the quiver Q that we had before. So um, now the theory on D-brains that's supported on D turns out to be a three-dimensional quiver gauge theory on D times S1, rather than simply a two-dimensional theory on D. Um, and this is um, because they're D-brains in string theory. So in string theory, one has to include an infinite tower of winding modes um, around the Riemer surface, which turn the theory on defects uh, supported on D to a um, three-dimensional quiver gauge theory on D times S1, where S1 is the dual of the circle in here. Anyway, um, the supersymmetric partition functions of the quiver gauge theory on D times S1 turn out to be exactly um, the vertex functions of quantum K theory. Um, of the Nakajima uh, quiver variety corresponding to Q. So the quiver variety is the Higgs branch of the gauge theory, 
The quasi maps uh, from D to X are simply vortex solutions of the theory. The Euler character is a vortex moduli. Um, what the vertex function computes um, are partition, uh, is what all, it's also what the partition function of the gauge theory on D times S1 computes. The partition function depends on which boundary conditions we impose at a T2 boundary and uh, infinity of, of D times S1. And um, so they, make, they can be th thought of as valid in equivariant elliptic homology of X. Um, now, the, um, so, so far I just explained what the conformal blocks are. The gauge theory and string theory interpretation of Q-conformal blocks fixes also um, the interpretation of um, elliptic R matrix elements, which describe their braiding. So elliptic R matrices are computed by um, partition functions of a three-dimensional gauge theory on T2 times an interval um, with positions of D-brains varying over the interval and with boundary conditions, um, with suitable boundary conditions at the ends. Now, the fact that um, theory on D-brains um, that, uh, that start out two-dimensional and supported on D is actually a three-dimensional theory on D times a circle can be made manifest using T-duality, which relates the B-type string we start with uh, on M6 with defects which are points on A with, oops, with A-type um, little string theory on a uh, different manifold where A is, uh, where the circle in A is replaced by a dual circle in H hack, and where the D-brains are uh, supported uh, wrap the corresponding S1. So the points become circles. It follows that um, partition function of integral of a lattice model um, such as this is the partition function of A type, because T duality changes the B to A type, is the partition function of A type little string theory on B, the plane where the lattice model lives, times uh, the complex plane that will go run along for the ride, times, uh, times a two torus. Um, that's the two torus at, um, <coughs> uh, where the, Two, two torus where the, where the, where the D-brains are. In other words, the D-brains that make up the lattice are three-dimensional. They are, they are three-dimensional, they, they, they are lines in this plane, and they have an additional two torus, right? Remember, um, we started the, their partition function on, on an, an infinite cigar times a circle computed conformal blocks. The boundary that at near the infinity that two torus, um, the, the, that manifold looks like a T2 times, uh, times R, and that T2 times R is what's visible in this picture, which all of which captures just the braiding. Anyway, oops. So in this language, um, the spectral curve of, of the integral of a lattice model parameter, um, with parameterizes from this perspective of A step string theory, holonomies of the three dimensional gauge fields on the torus where the gauge still lives. All right, so um, you can get trigonometric and rational integrable models by decompactifying the spectral curve. Um, now the spectral curve is a curve where holonomies live. So string theory relates this to shrinking uh, the dual, uh, one or two or both cycles of the dual torus. <clears throat> And, um, okay. So now, um, it turns out that the string theory perspective also helps unify other approaches to integrable lattice models. Now, um, Nekrasov and Shatashvili showed in 2009 that Bayes ansatz for solving lattice models on a torus has a gauge theory interpretation. Um, the partition function of a lattice model on a torus, um, so the base, the base answer goes as follows. If you've been in any talk on integrable lattice models, I'm sure you've seen it, but here's, here it is. So the partition function of a lattice model on a torus can be uh, rewritten in terms, of, um, in terms of transfer matrices. So the transfer matrices, uh, here's one transfer matrix, is defined as a, as, um, by taking a partial trace of, 
of R matrices, in this case elliptic R matrices, around um, one of the cycles of the torus. The fact that elliptic R, mat that R matrices solve young baxter equation implies that transfer matrices inserted at different times, really different points in the spectral curve, commute. Now, it follows that if we wish to compute the partition function of an integrable lattice model on a torus, in fact, we don't need to know the R matrices themselves that sit at these vertices. It suffices to know a much simpler object. It suffices to know the eigenvalues of transfer matrices, which is a vast simplification. Bethan does then um, computes the torus partition function by identifying the eigenvalues of transfer matrices magically with critical points of an auxiliary potential that, depend on, uh, that depends on, on beta roots. So critical points of this potential uh, get identified with eigenvalues of transfer matrices and simplify the problem of solving exactly the partition function of the lattice model on a torus. Now, Nekasov and Shatashvili showed the following remarkable fact. They showed that um, the potential, this auxiliary potential that entered the beta ansatz, is in fact an effective superpotential of a four-dimensional gauge theory on a torus times um, the dual of the spectral curve. Um, the solutions, um, and moreover, they showed that solutions to beta uh, equations are the supersymmetric vacua of this four-dimensional gauge theory. And uh, it follows that, and furthermore, they um, um, show that the partition function of the integrable lattice model is the T2, is the partition function of a four-dimensional gauge theory on T2 uh, times the dual of the spectral curve in presence of gauge theory observables at inserted at points of the T2. OK, now that's a lot of words. Let's see what actually happened here. So what we are doing is we are relating partition function of an integrable lattice model, here's a lattice on a torus, to a partition function of a gauge theory on a different torus with point observables. Okay. Now, it's natural to ask, what do these two pictures have to do with each other? A priori, which gauge theory should we study to solve a particular lattice model? And which observables should we take? Going from this picture to this picture, if you want, is precisely the magic of the beta ansatz. Now, recall that partition function of a lattice model such as this is a partition function of some six-dimensional A-type string theory, where the plane of the lattice model um, is uh, part of the six-dimensional space, with some three-dimensional d branch supported on this line and the dual of the spectral curve. Now, uh, this is for lattice model in the plane. This little string theory makes sense actually on any B which is flat. So in particular, we can take B to be a torus and study integrable lattice models on a torus. Now, in string theory, any time you see a picture like this, you'll say, okay, there's a much simpler system to study. We can simply do T-duality. Um, and um, T-duality along, uh, say, this cycle of the torus replacing it with a, uh, with a, with a dual uh, circle and, a, and has getting a dual torus. So what this does is it takes the, 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 the D-brains on these vertical edges into D-brains that fill the dual torus and the D-brains on the horizontal edges to D-brains that are points on the torus. T-duality changes dimensions of brains, but it leaves the matter content fixed. It doesn't change it. Okay. So, if you want to read off which theory um, on the D branch uh, lives on the D branch, you simply um, need to um, look at the representations and the weights coloring the vertical edges. Um, the point observables in this gauge theory on the torus arise by integrating out strings between brains of the T duality. So, we can understand um, the Bayes-Ansatz approach to integrable lattice models as a consequence of T-duality in little string theory. Now, there's another route we could have taken uh, from string theory to st study integrable lattice models, um, which is we could, instead of 
understanding the, the theory from perspective of D-brains that make up the lattices themselves, one could try to understand the same system from perspective of the bulk six-dimensional theory. Um, it turns out that this will lead us towards the description of lattice models that's being developed by Costello, Witten, and Yamazaki. So here's how this goes. Um, so as, as we said many times by now, a partition function um, of a lattice model like this is in fact, comes from A-type string theory on B, this plane with defects that are D-brains supported on a torus and point at a, and this extra complex plane, so three-dimensional D-brains. Now, type A string theory has a T-duality symmetry that trades on um, the torus, and remember I had three-dimensional D-brains supported on this torus, that takes D-brains that are supported entirely on this torus to D-brains that are points on the dual torus. Um, now, the dual torus is the, uh, the spectral curve of the integrable lattice model itself. So, in the dual description, we get a six-dimensional type A string theory on B, where the lattice model lives, times the spectral curve itself, times an extra complex plane with defects that are lines in B. Moreover, from bulk perspective, from perspective of the stuff in six dimensions, um, the R matrix is a scattering amplitude of heavy particles in this theory. Um, with, so remember, the bulk is a little string theory of type A, which contains gauge field. And um, the R matrix is, um, is a scattering matrix of, of heavy particles whose charges um, label are representation labels on the edges. Um, they live in B, well, where you see the lines, and that points um, on the, in, in the spectral curve. The gauge theory um, in the bulk at low energies is a G-type gauge theory, which turns out to have a transimus type term. Namely, T-duality that takes this torus to this torus also generates, turns out to generate a three-form um, flux that um, sources a six-dimensional transimus term. And the, moreover, in the point particle in low energy limit, um, one, um, one can argue that this theory looks like an effective four-dimensional gauge theory on B times C based on uh, Lie algebra G and with transimus type interaction. Um, here, um, dx is a holomorphic one form of, on C, which we understand is being induced by the flux. So this is exactly the description of integrable lattice models. That's the starting point of work by Costello, Yamazaki, and Witten. So um, from string theory, we've um, reached a, a unified picture of, um, of different approaches to integrable lattice models. Um, one where uh, we explicitly compute the R matrices of lattice models from geometry that come, that's induced by D brains and string theory. One uh, that comes from Bay um, and it works for lattice models on a torus, and then this um, approach by um, Costelli, and Mazaki, and Witten. Um, okay, that's all I wanted to tell you in today's lecture. Um, for the tomorrow's lecture, we'll use many of the same ingredients that appeared in this talk, but we'll use them um, differently. We'll use them, um, we'll apply them to a different problem, um, namely that of um, not categorification. We'll be able to do that for the following reason. Note that this, what we've done here is we've, we've been, we, we were able um, to obtain, via string theory, lattice models as supersymmetric partition functions of gauge theories. Mm -hmm. And that anytime you're able to do this, it means that categorification of the problem is around the corner. And um, what we'll do tomorrow, of course, the story about lattice models is not a story about knot invariants, um, but um, it turns out the story about knot invariants comes, um, um, comes out of it too. So, all right, so that's about tomorrow. Thank you.